Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. The man who would be baseball's iron horse was born to German immigrants in New York's Upper East Side the same year of the first World Series. Lou Gehrig would attend Columbia College on both a football and baseball scholarship. Despite the fact he was a football player, he did not have the square shoulders. He had the lovely sloping shoulders that mean flexibility and batting strength. Gehrig was 22 years old when he signed with the Yankees. He saw limited playing time in his first two years, mostly as a pinch hitter. But that all changed on June 2nd, 1925. Once Gehrig stepped foot on the field to replace Pip at first, he did not miss a game for the next 14 years, starting a streak that spanned 2,130 games. Along the way, he and Ruth cemented their place in one of the all-time greatest lineups. And together, they redefined power in baseball. Unparalleled in all history, uh, Ruth and Gary coming up together, and uh, you couldn't walk one without uh, risking what would happen to the next guy you pitched to. The numbers Gary put up along the way were astounding. The left-handed slugger had seven seasons with 150 or more RBIs, eight seasons with 200 or more hits, and five seasons with more than 40 home runs. He was a seven-time All-Star, two-time AL MVP, a Triple Crown winner, and a six-time World Series champion. And though he'd play second fiddle, first to Ruth and later to Joe DiMaggio, Gary earned the respect of those he played with. He was a great team man. Uh, he hated to lose like everybody does, but I mean, Lou was the type of fellow that would come in, we'd be three, four runs behind. He said, come on now, we're not beat yet. The fact that he played so well and kept the streak alive for so long was even more impressive considering how often he played hurt. His injuries included a broken thumb, a broken toe, and back spasms. Later in his career, Gehrig's hands were x-rayed, and doctors found 17 different fractures that he played through. What finally benched him was ALS, a disease now named after him. In 39, after he only scraped together six singles in the first seven games, he went to manager Joe McCarthy and asked to be taken out of the lineup ending his streak and his career on May 2nd, 1939, when he was just 36. We never knew how serious it was uh, when he first took himself out. And naturally, uh, we felt bad to see his streak broken because I think we were more or less more interested, I believe, the players on our club in keeping his streak alive than Lou was. Lou was more or less, uh, he, he said he wasn't helping, the, he felt he wasn't helping the club when he uh, took himself out of the lineup. Then on July 4th of that year, the Yankees honored Gehrig in between the games of a doubleheader. The day was advertised as a tribute to Lou. There was such an outpouring of fans that every seat at Yankee Stadium was filled. And, and, and official after official and player after player of the Yankees came along and spoke into the microphone, spoke of the great affection from Lou and what he meant to them. Then it was Gehrig's turn to step to the mic. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. that I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. Thank you. That's the day I saw photographers cry. Gehrig died two years after that famous farewell speech. His consecutive game streak stood 
for 56 years and was long considered unbreakable until Cal Ripken Jr. surpassed it in 1995. In a strange twist of time, June 2nd would also be the day Gehrig died, 16 years after Wally Pipp's headache.